Good day and welcome to our webcast, Launch a Successful Predictive Maintenance Program, brought to you by CFE Media and Technology and sponsored by IMI Sensors, a PCB division. We're joined today by Mo Abuwali, Managing Partner, IOT Co., and Kelly Kinepley, Chief Information Officer with Dexco Global. I'm Kevin Parker, an editor with CFE Media. Today's presentation can provide continuing education credits. CFE Media has met the standards and requirements of the Registered Continuing Education Program. Credit earned on completion of this program will be reported to RECEP at RECEP.net. Manufacturers are moving from preventive maintenance to real-time condition monitoring and predictive maintenance due to breakthroughs in sensing, analytics, and other aspects of the industrial Internet of Things. However, given an excess of caution, they are doing so slowly. What are the principles of technology project management that can help manufacturers to move more expeditiously? Mo Abuwali of IOTCO says if, if the maintenance project can be seen as a three-legged stool that includes technology, process, and people, it's often people that present the greatest challenge. Abuwali suggests the following people-centric emphases can promote more effective project management. Focus on data value, foster a culture of innovation, establish a smart manufacturing steering committee, empower digital change champions, and make internal communications a change management priority. Kelly Kinepley is Chief Information Officer at Dexco Global, a leading maker of highly engineered running gear, including axles, chassis, and other components for towable equipment makers. During the webcast, Kinepley will discuss details of how Dexco transitioned to predictive maintenance for some of its most important processes. You see before you some of the learning objectives for today's program. This event is a live educational webcast presented on September 2nd, 2021. The educational category is technical health and safety. Here are some tips to help you get the most from today's webcast. If you experience issues with the slides or audio, refresh the browser or click the refresh media button under the presenter's picture. Control the volume of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or on the webcast platform. For technical problems with the audio or slides, click on the question mark at the top right hand corner of the screen to access a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message in the ask a question box and someone will get to you as quickly as possible. The ask a question box is also used to ask the speakers questions. The live session will begin after the presentations conclude. Today's webcast is being recorded. You'll receive an email within a week with the link to the on-demand event. To take the learning unit exam, use the learning unit exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a separate browser window. You can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs up. We'd now like to share with you a brief video from today's webcast sponsor, IMI Sensors, a PCB division. I'd now like to introduce today's speakers. 
Kelly Kanepley is Chief Information Officer for Dexco Global. Kelly provides leadership for a global organization focused on the continued development of an innovative, robust, and secure information technology environment. His primary responsibilities are focused on global architecture, security, governance, collaboration, and innovative services to all operational and functional areas. His global, culturally diverse organization delivers and supports centralized services and takes pride in its focus on the company's critical manufacturing operations. Also with us today is Mo Abuwali. Mo is Managing Partner and Chief Evangelist with IOTCO LLC, located in the Cincinnati area. IOTCO helps clients create a competitive advantage through digital transformation. In addition, Mo is Adjunct Professor at the University of Cincinnati College of Engineering and Applied Science. Mo has a doctorate in the philosophy of industrial engineering from the University of Cincinnati. Mo, welcome to today's webcast and please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much, Kevin, for the introduction. Uh, this is Mo Abwali, and uh, thank you, Kelly Nepley, for being with us as a, as a guest speaker. Um, very briefly, um, I represent IoT Company. I've been in the industrial engineering field for about 20, 20 plus years. Um, and we like to say that our DNA is the manufacturing industry. Um, we provide technologies to support manufacturers uh, to embrace industry 4.0 and to uh, drive toward what we call a zero downtime, zero defect vision of operation. And we'll actually discuss today some of those technologies. Um, and I'll give uh, uh, setting the stage around what is industry 4.0, uh, what is a factory of the future strategy look like. Um, and then I'm very pleased to have Kelly Nepley talk about how to actually launch a successful digital program uh, with focus on predictive maintenance. Um, and then we'll be glad to uh, wrap it up and answer any questions you might have. So thank you for being with us today. So moving ahead, um, you know, Industry 4.0 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution um, was actually a, a German-born initiative many years ago, uh, which uh, proliferated really fast around the world. Uh, in the U.S., the uh, National Association of Manufacturers, NAM, uh, referred to the movement as Manufacturing 4.0. Um, but if you if you look at it from a um, internal and external perspective to your operation, from an external perspective, you have end users uh, and suppliers and industry 4.0 technologies and uh, predictive maintenance programs can impact your suppliers and clients. But on the other hand, within your manufacturing operation internally, different functions like production, logistics, maintenance and quality um, can uh, achieve even a more significant and positive impact by implementing industry 4.0 tools like uh, predictive maintenance. So that automation pyramid you see right there, which is an ISA 95 automation pyramid, resembles uh, a typical digital stack within a factory or within an operation from the machine layer to the data acquisition layer to the execution layer and then to the business layer, which is your uh, enterprise resource planning. But the whole idea of Industry 4.0 is how to achieve IT and OT convergence. These are information technologies, and you have operational technologies, and the convergence and bringing together people, process, and technology uh, is really the key to, to a successful predictive maintenance program, which we will talk about today. So uh, four, four key elements that we'll be referring to during the presentation is when you're launching such a strategy and such a program, what technologies make sense? And then how do you couple those technologies with the right type of analytics implemented on the right machines, critical machines within your operation um, that are connected and capturing real time relevant data for the analytics? And at the end of the day, uh, what is the business case? What is the return on investment and ROI from implementing the solution? So we always like to uh, start with the ROI. Uh, return on investment is, is critical. And uh, Kelly will uh, talk more uh, practically about the impact of this within uh, manufacturing and within operation. But if you look at Industry 4.0 tools and predictive maintenance specifically, 
one of the key metrics it can impact is the OEE of the operation. OEE is overall equipment effectiveness. That's your uptime, your performance, speed, and your quality. Um, not to mention labor productivity. By digitizing and implementing such tools, it has immediate impact on uh, providing real-time data, analytics, and prediction to the maintenance organization, the quality organization, and significantly improving labor productivity and shifting the mindset from a reactive, potentially manually driven operation to a more predictive and prescriptive um, and proactive operation. Uh, but it's not just about improving uptime. It's also about linking to other systems within the operation, especially uh, maintenance systems, uh, spare part systems, maintenance scheduling, labor allocation, so that you are able to have predictive insights. You can reduce spare parts on hand, which is an overhead for the business. You can have more proactive scheduling and even predictive replenishment of spare parts in your operation. So we're, we're going to talk about how to set up such a successful predictive maintenance program that can lead to a direct impact on the business bottom line. That is the vision. The vision is driving towards, call it near zero downtime and near zero waste within the manufacturing space and directly impacting the, uh, the business P&L in a positive way. So where to start? Um, and Kelly will talk about this in more detail, but the concept of thinking big, starting small, and acting fast. Um, supply chains are becoming more complex. Um, customers and suppliers are becoming uh, uh, more complex and also sensitive about uh, speed of execution, implementation. On the other hand, um, you know, hardware capabilities, sensor capabilities, uh, connectivity capabilities, are actually getting cheaper. The cost of a sensor that used to be in the four digits is now $100 to $200 to buy a vibration sensor and implement it on a machine. So with that trade-off of increasing demand and increasing competitiveness and cheaper computation needs and cheaper sensors and cheaper hardware uh, enables uh, companies large and small to actually go ahead and think big, um, find, your ecosystem, find technology partners and education institutions and workforce to help you along your path. And then start small by selecting critical assets that, that prove the ROI for the business and then acting fast and scaling fast, proving it quickly within weeks and months uh, rather than years. And then uh, taking that ROI and uh, marketing that success within the operation and then scaling that template across the operation. So this concept is, is really supporting manufacturers to embark on their smart factory journey. But when it comes to um, starting small, there is a lot of areas to start. And this is actually based on a research from uh, LNS, LNS Research, where they created what's called a use case navigator. And in the use case navigator, the question was, where should I start as an organization? So I'm thinking big, but I want to start small. Do I want to start on my connected products, on the actual products I'm producing? Do I need to augment the worker, the operator, as in connected worker? Do I need to do something in supply chain? Do I need to do something with customer experience? But in fact, the, one of the results of the survey was connected assets was the number one um, selected application that delivered the biggest ROI for the business in manufacturing versus other applications. Um, and specifically within the connected assets use case, um, there were multiple use cases, but the three core use cases that um, demonstrated, uh, uh, I would say, the, the largest surveyed uh, number of, of uh, ROI delivered to the business was number one, connecting to assets, monitoring performance and capturing data, real-time data. Number two, implementing artificial intelligence and machine learning on that data to, uh, to provide predictive maintenance metrics that impact and improve your PM schedule and your spare part management. And number three was actually starting to correlate some of that machine data that, that is being used for predictive maintenance with process data in order to detect and predict defects on, uh, on machines. And we actually had a separate CFE webinar previously, early on this year, 
about predictive quality. Um, today's focus will be on predictive maintenance and launching a successful uh, PDM program. But there was really some common success factors, and I can summarize and say that number one, um, it has to be a, a scalable approach that not only gives a win to my business or my location here, but multiple locations across my organization. Number two, integration strategies is very important. Um, a lot of systems are legacy, not just on the machine layer with older machines, but also on the business layer. So those legacy or sometimes referred to as monument systems um, are usually difficult to integrate. So an, an integration and interoperability strategy is key for success in a PDM program. And number three and four is really about the people. It is communication, providing the right information to the right person at the right time and making it easier for the maintenance and operations functions to make decisions in a more proactive fashion. And lastly, um, there are successes, but there are also failures. And when failures were analyzed, there were really four key failure modes, according to the research, um, that, have, uh, that have led to the lack of success of implementing things like predictive maintenance on, and other industry 4.0 tools. And the first one is about that convergence from the IT and the OT layer. And Kelly will talk more about that. Um, the other one is that there's a lot of data, and in many cases, the data is siloed and is not uh, integrated together. Uh, the third one being that we're only focusing on a specific area and we don't have the bigger vision. And the fourth one being not starting on your factory floor and starting in other areas like logistics, supply chain, and so on, even though there is an ROI in those areas, but actually the biggest ROI was proven in the uh, manufacturing space right on the shop floor. Um, so some of the success factors that we'll be talking more about in this presentation include A, how to form a cross-functional team and a steering committee. Number two, how to have a well-executed data model, how to collect the right data from the right assets that are critical to the business. Number three, not just looking within the four walls, but going beyond the four walls and having an ecosystem and having a third party folks that are also supporting your strategy. And last but not least, and this is a real number based on a survey of I think more than a thousand executives, 75% of the top use cases uh, were actually oriented on the shop floor, right on the machines, right on the critical lines in the factory. And those delivered the biggest return on capital investment, return on uh, ROI for the business. So with this setting the stage, um, I really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to have Kelly Nepley here with us today. Um, I'll hand it to you, Kelly, to talk about the uh, practical side of establishing a successful program. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thanks a lot, Mo. Appreciate the introduction. Um, yeah, I, I can't get in, in front of folks and talk about this without first addressing something. It's to me, I think, huge, and I'm all about sustainability and longevity of a program. And and as far as I'm concerned, nothing does that better than getting in front of your executives and establishing a digital program at the highest level of executive support you can to ensure that the activities you would take in something like predictive maintenance it can be sustainable. And I've done it both ways. I've I've engaged in these grassroots efforts to try to put a new technology in place. And even when successful, the ability to copy and paste it and, and share that around the organization scale success is, just did not happen. So um, the absolute best way to do this is to institutionalize digital in your organization. It's a very critical first step. And you can kind of bring these things along in parallel. And practically, that's really what I did the last company I worked for and actually had the most success. And what I'm talking about here is you know getting you know, a common definition of digital around the organization. You know, what exactly are we talking about? For a lot of companies, this will be new or it'll be new for a lot of people. And most importantly, creating a sense of purpose. You know, why are we doing this? And, um, you know, people aren't going to jump on a bandwagon just because it's a cool technology. Everybody's busy and has things to do. So creating that purpose is really, really huge. Understanding success factors and driving those through every part of your program. Um, Establishing governance. Nobody likes red tape and a lot of meetings that are not value add, but having a really strong executive led steering committee in this space will do nothing but allow you 
to scale that success and act fast like Mel was talking about. I mean, building a framework and, and build structure for execution, these, these are where work really starts to happen. The framework explains the who and the how, and the structure for execution probably leverages some things you already do today around continuous improvement, but helps you understand where you're trying to go and how you spawn something within a project to go be successful. Yeah, so as we step through some of these, you know, defining what digital means, and this is can be any definition that you want that would resonate. My favorite is this one. You know, digitalization is a nearly instant, free, and flawless ability to connect people, devices, and physical objects anywhere. Very, very broad definition, very simple, but it's all about connectivity, sharing information, and that core of data management that Mo referred to is really, really huge. It creates identity. It's you can't launch a program in an organization not knowing exactly what digital means, and this is really where it starts. Uh, create core, you know, creating a core purpose, you know, establishing that why. You know, we, we we've all been around initiatives where why wasn't clearly established, and they all fail. But you know, the the thing that I've used forever in this, you know, if we're not solving real business issues, you know we're really getting off on the wrong foot to start with. We, we don't do technology for technology's sake. You know, we're here to help. And that's coming from a global corporate organization that may sound counterproductive, but really if we're not solving real business issues and driving bottom line via revenue, EBITDA, OE, and et cetera, we're really doing it for the wrong reasons. Um, and you see some other things on there too. You know, we're integrating our business, which is speaking about you know, like those connected asset concept and the digital definition. We had earlier improving financial results, but at the end of the day, this is a different way of thinking. We're applying technology and, and newer processes into mainstream manufacturing where they haven't been before, and you really got to get organized around why we're doing it. Some key success factors, the awareness and eagerness at all levels. Um, you got to go find those champions. You know, you, the CEO's got to be in your hip pocket, the COO, and you got to find those people that are going to be preaching right along with you all the way down to the plant floor. And that's really, really huge. And you have to educate and you have to drive that through the organization. Um, global coordination, I've had a lot of debate with people around whether this can work regionally or not. Can we have three or four different programs running at the same time? And, you know, when it comes time to scale, that really starts to fail. And if you really want to leverage something really good like predictive maintenance, where we have a successful proof of concept around the organization, having a global structure in place to copy and paste around the organization is, is definitely the way to go. Um, internal knowledge hubs, I'm going to get into that quite a bit later. Um, engaging with technology partners. You know, we're, we're, you're never going to staff a team um, with every skill that you need to be able to do different digital technologies. I'm just never going to do it. So selecting partners is huge in every aspect of this. You may need technology partners or partners in general just to figure out where to start. And I've done that before. You know, help us form a steering committee. Help us form a purpose. Help us figure out what's most important to us. Help us figure out where to start. And then you, then you can, as you go down into actually executing some plans, find those technology partners. So you'll never be able to do it by yourself. That's going to be something common all along. Um, getting access to skills, you're going to have to reskill or hire new skills, and long-term sustainability. So um, I, I can't say enough. Like if we're not thinking that this is not just a two-year project or a five-year project, this is a new way of doing business. Um, if we're not thinking that up front and, and thinking about long-term sustainability, you're going to have problems down the road. A couple notes about governance. Um, like I said, it, it's always something people turn their nose up at, they've got to report out to the steering committee, but this is really where the concept of um, getting that energy, enthusiasm, getting the commitment, when you see the highest ranking leaders of the organization getting behind this and taking a proactive approach and driving this to the organization, insisting upon best practice happening, insisting on priorities being set, common partners, and these are your C-level executive folks. When this is this is being seen around the organization. You know, we've done promotional videos where the global CEO is talking about our program and some success we had. This is really the energy, direction, the accountability that every program needs to be successful. You see it in small projects and you can see it in a big transformative thing like having a digital program here as well. 
Um, th these are just an example of some digital enterprise segments that I'm going to actually dive into a little more on the next slide. You know, this is, you know, when we look at framework, you know, framework is nothing more than, you know, I would say, a better way of explaining to the organization how we're going to get this done and who do we need to make it successful. Um, so there's a lot of stuff on here. We're not going to dig too deeply into everything. You know, the, the framework, you know, it starts with the strategy, the steering committee, um, maybe even your board of directors drives for you starting up top. And you've got these digital enterprise segments to there in the middle. So having representation from supply chain and manufacturing and your back office functions and your customer facing functions, having those guys contributing to the discussions on what's important for us is really important. Um, the, the, the green layer, the knowledge hubs to me is really a key you know, for what we what we do as an organization digital and what may be in those boxes for you are different than what may have been in for me. And you're not going to be focusing in on all six of these at the same time. We really focused in on two to start with, and that was a lot, but it really helps focus the organization and it, and it really gives you a sense of direction for everybody on how we're going to accomplish things. This is, a, this is essentially a center of excellence where if you decide that predictive is where you want to be going, predictive solves most of your business problems and the alignment and, and the fast pace of it's going to give you quick results. You know, you're going to create a center of excellence around predictive. You're going to put people on it. You're going to dedicate them to it. You're going to find partners around it. They're going to be dropping into locations where you're going to be doing pilots. And when that's successful, they're going to take that success and they're going to copy paste that to other locations. And as you start bringing on other aspects of, of, uh, of knowledge hubs, for example, data collection, data management, you're going to do the same thing. And this is the place where you start to foster that energy and enthusiasm and finding that talent in the organization to give them that opportunity to step up out of their comfort zone, to be part of something bigger. And they take that energy and enthusiasm back to their job when they're not traveling around, putting technology into their locations. That knowledge hub concept is really huge and it really drove a lot of engagement with projects that we did. And lastly, at the bottom, you see all the ancillary things you need like IT and human resources to help you be successful. But at the end of the day, all this is geared towards targeted business outcomes. We don't do any of this because it's really cool stuff. We do it because it's good for the organization. We're fixing business challenges and we have business outcomes that we're all driving for. At the end of the day, it drives every decision happening. So moving forward really quick, you know, from this, you know, kind of a top level look, again, longevity, you know, thinking of this as the future way of how we do business, how we solve problems, um, getting those targeted outcomes identified that will help you drill down into those digital areas that you really need to help you get there, um, getting those knowledge hubs set up, getting the education and the goals established for all the areas that you of the targeted outcome. This has really becomes a structured approach from here. We have, we have our steering committee, we have our targeted outcomes, we have our high level goals. We know what knowledge hubs we're going to be, be, be reeling in here. We, we commit our resources to it and then we start to execute. And this is where the whole concept of think big, start small, act fast comes into play. You know, you, you want to take a concept like predictive, you want to get your knowledge hub set up you want to think about having that capability in everywhere in the organization and having a world-class OEE, um, a huge improvement for the global company, but you start small. You go have a small success, a small pilot, make sure it works, and you can even fail, but if you fail, you fail small. You restart, try it again, and that's happened. So that's happened to me. We, we had the wrong plant, we had the wrong asset, which I'll talk to you about in a little bit. And then you, you, when you do get that success, you scale it from a machine to a line, to a plant, to a second plant, to a third plant, and you go scale fast. That's really, 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 really important. And lastly, enough governance to be efficient. Don't overdo it, but make sure it's business leadership driven. So moving on, yeah, we'll start moving now more into what predictive, you know, how do we start to align predictive with what we're doing? I mean, th with the concept of having these massive targeted business outcomes in place and more specifically, you know, strategy here about, the, for an example with this slide, a world-class OEE. Um, we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to take our operations to a new level. And when you, when you look at how this is structured, we start to really think about how we're going to do this. 
You know, so our digital related goal is to utilize digital PDM to improve OE. And that's spawning other goals in the organization that we continue drilling down until we find an opportunity to have a pilot project. So here we're being very specific in your, your knowledge hub and your business that you're going to be focusing a proof of concepts on with this predictive, with, with a predictive pilot like we're really getting to here, all towards a goal of world-class OEE. This is creating structure in the organization. So if you skip this step and you really don't have a very specific goals everywhere, we've got goals centered around downtime. We have, even have some goals around quality, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's really important that we get this structure in place so we're handing off to project teams something very, very specific for them to execute. So as we, as we start making that case for predictive analytics, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to show you like a favorite diagram ever. I think I've shown it a thousand times. And, and Mo talked about data as one of the key things here. I'm going to preach that again real quick. So as we start talking about predictive, you know, if you see predictive in here, it's an adjacent technology. And this slide, this, this diagram really says, you know, as you go farther to the right, you start um, being more transformational. Um, we've down the bottom left hand side, you're you're getting to your core technologies are really prerequisites to be able to do more things like automation, artificial intelligence, traceability, and predictive. If you skip the core, if you don't build a strong foundation to be a data rich organization, you're you're, you're going to have to step back and you're going to have to redo some things. This is a really, really big deal. You need to involve your IT teams, you know, think really hard what partners you need and build that competency in getting data from wherever you have it today and wherever you want it from the future and think about how you want to do that. This really transforms your thinking. Now, the whole definition of digital, you know, everything's connected and what do I do with the data? You have to keep that in mind. You need to start there. So before you dive into, um, you know, putting a predictive software in place, you've got to get the data aspect of it figured out. So, I mean, the, the case for predictive, you know, this, you know, echoing everything Mo said, you see some of the same information here. You know, why why predictive and why are we having a goal of world-class OE and talking about predictive? You know, for us, you know, it was very simply a very fast way to show very good return on investment and it's a very simple technology to copy and paste around the organization. And we stepped back in, in one example in, in, in a previous company I worked for, and we did the data collection, the data strategy up front. The things that we could touch with this was amazing. And the one thing I, I always like to highlight that my first pilot with this, we actually saved more money with quality savings and our first proof of concept with predictive maintenance than we did with the maintenance savings. We, you know, we kept the machine up longer. We proved that within weeks. But you know, we ended up censoring and having challenges with components of a machine that was touching the part, our end part that, that goes to the customer. And when that part started to wear and needed to be replaced, or if you didn't, it caused downtime, which we're, where our target was to eliminate that, it also started to produce bad parts. So by focusing on keeping the machine running as smooth as possible, a byproduct of that a lot of times can be quality. So you're really predicting quality issues as well. There's so many things predictive maintenance touches. Selecting that is where we wanted to go. It was a no brainer for us for sure. So let's jump into um, really the, the nuts and bolts on the predictive side. So this is just a slide depicting kind of the evolution. And I would have guessed if you're a a company that's got multiple locations, you've got folks aligning in different spots here. And in some places, in one plant, you may be doing, you know, you just may, may be doing totally reactive in some lines, some places you're doing preventative. But what we're talking about here is we're talking about predicting the future. You know, we're not talking about reacting to something or changing something on the number of cycles, which has its place, but we're talking about adding value by predicting the future. So you know, getting started, the, the concept here of getting a proof of concept launched for predictive, you mean there's certainly, this, this is huge. So you've, you've, you successfully have a steering committee, you've got some targeted outcomes and strategies, and you've selected predictive as the technology that gets you there, predictive maintenance. You have a knowledge hub established, people engage, a partner engaged. So what do you don't want to do? You don't want to screw it up the first time you try it. 
So for me, getting this launched, I've done it the wrong way once, and it's definitely just a better approach. Being very structured upon selecting the proof of concept and executing in a very structured way that can be repeated over and over again is a really big deal. So you know, establishing that goal for a particular asset is a really big deal. So we're, we're, we've got an asset and we've got to set specific goals, but picking the right assets is really the point I want to get to here. Picking the right asset and using data to pick that um, and making a rec and getting an asset in place with your proof of concept that is very impactful. You know, if you're going to save the company $300 a month by improving downtime by 50%, which is a huge percentage, the $50 a month isn't going to mean anything. If it's something that every time it goes down, it's worth tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, that's impactful. So picking the right, and then the approach around leveraging data to figure all that out and making sure this isn't a technology thing. And I'm gonna be all over this for the rest of my slide deck. This is a, needs to be an expert driven. You have maintenance personnel and operations personnel out there today. You need to bring those folks into every single one of those. And, and, and when you start to think about, you know, these X's here are asset opportunities for being being your pilot. And, and this is a very generic, def, very, very ge, um, generic diagram. There's a lot of things here on these X's that they just have a better, they're better served using preventative maintenance and they're better preserved just having spare parts sitting at the line. Um, then there's some good candidates that the impact cost wise, like I said, are bigger for the organization. As you, as you start to lay out some of the analytics that I've seen companies use, and I'm not qualified to talk about these charts, but essentially what's happening here is we're drilling down into different types of robots and different failure modes happening in robots to understand where we're going to focus. And this seems you know, overkill. And here we are at a, you know, a pretty summary presentation on predictive. Why are we looking at these scatter diagrams? It's really huge to be successful here. So proving, proving the capability of your predictive maintenance program depends on a successful pilot. And we need to make sure we select the right assets for that. So as we have the assets identified, this is the next step in this thing is essentially working the process. So the, the, the pilot goes well, and we need to copy paste this thing around the organization. And it's, it's a really a simple process. You know, start step one is the data collection piece. So, you know, ideally, you develop some competency around that before by doing the proof of concept. Now we've got you know, signal processing and feature extraction. We've got to get the information out of these assets. We have to correlate it together, stick it someplace. We got to have a data lake there. We have selected a, a good piece of predictive software to help us with that. And the meat and potatoes of this is is analyzing everything. And every time you go to do this, you have to repeat the step over and over again. We're selecting the right assets. You know, we're doing the data collection. We're being very mindful about how we're correlating and bringing data in and where we're getting it from. And then we're applying the right technology around to help us figure out what's gonna happen in the future. And just to stop, stop one second on the data collection side of things, I think one thing that's missed here is, is a lot of companies will focus in on just the data coming from the sensors on the machine. And, and, that, and, and maybe a vibration sensor is going to be the answer to figuring out that one component. But if you really want a comprehensive program, you need to take a look at all the data you have available from, for example, a, a controller. You know, we have a PLC on that thing and we're collecting 30 data points every cycle. Maybe there's some correlation with some of that information with the sensor information that allows us to understand what the future may hold for that machine. And maybe there's some history around maintenance that we've done with a CMMS system. Maybe there's another database of fault codes or something, but we need to give thought around that entire data front as we start to execute this over and over again, ensuring we get data coming from all the right resources. And then at the end, you know, cutting, cutting to the chase of where we want to hope to be. Ideally, when all this stuff comes together, this is what you're looking at on a regular basis. You know, you've got a, a great piece of software here that's looking at all the history of what's going on and giving you a good health assessment of, of the asset that's in question here. And it's making a prediction. I mean, this graph is saying you're going to have a failure at this red line and you need to do something. And this diagnosis is saying, you know, here's what we're gleaning from all the data coming from wherever we're getting data from. 
on where it's probably the, the root cause of that. This is an input for the organization to go be better. And this is really the end that you're driving to. This is where you put it all together and you have some success. Without this, um, I mean, everything you do in the beginning is great, but you've got to make sure you have a good tool and you get this in the hands of the right people. And circling back around to the right people and a failure mode here, that's incredibly important to remember. Um, we, we, we don't do digital because it's cool. We do it because it solves business problems and help us achieve targeted business outcomes at a massive scale. We also, you know, we don't do digital and technology and exclude everything else from a legacy standpoint that exists in the organization. You've got experts all over the organization that know a machine or know a process front and back and have been doing it for many years. Um, the data is, is really important, but the insights you gain from these experts on um, just some things maybe you don't have any data from at all. Not only do they, they can give you additional information, they can validate your results. They, they may have very valid reasons why what you're seeing isn't going to work, and that helps you tweak the process. So, you know, a big failure mode here is not including everybody from the beginning. You don't bring a team in, the knowledge hub can't land, and do everything by themselves. You got to bring the business folks in, and it needs to be expert driven from the beginning. You know, this is just a tool. This is a tool in the toolbox now. Um, so as you start to think about moving on, about integrating with the business, you've got most every company has some really good um, world-class continuous improvement processes, and they've worked for years and years and years. This is something that needs to be inserted into that. You know, you, you don't want to be an island off to yourself. You want to be an integrated business and digital technologies and the data and the and the, uh, what you glean from that data needs to be part of what you have already in place. Your experts are part of it. Your continuous improvement and problem solving methodologies are part of it. Um, all that together gets to be really, really powerful. So if you bring all those things together, the people, the technology, and, and the process you already have, there's, that's where you're gonna get your breakthrough performance. So kind of kind of wrap everything up before we can hand it back to, know, back, back to Mo. Um, specific to predictive that, you know, what's important to remember the foundation of some of that core digital technology site, remember that one slide, the foundation of data um, is, is just huge. You, you've got to make sure you step back and have a plan for that. You got to have the right partners for that. You got to have the right internal expertise for that, the right technology for all that. And you got to be thinking big. Remember to think big and you think big, not just in what your targeted outcomes are, you think big on all the strategies that you decide upon as you're going through that. You don't want to put something in place and then outgrow it and put something different in place down the road. Really stop and think about how you're going to manage data. You know, predictive, you know, why predictive? Low investment, high return, and you can scale it very quickly. You know, once the energy and enthusiasm is had at a, at a proof of a concept in one location and people see the results, copy pasting it around is not going to be a problem. Having a very structured approach around predict predictive maintenance. All assets are not, 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 are not equal. Um, some are just not are the right asset for predictive. That being said, collecting data from it may not be a bad idea, but when you're doing your proof of concept, you've got to set yourself up for success and make sure what you prevent, what you prevent and what you give to the business is huge and it's very impactful. And then as you go forward, continuing to work the process, pick the right assets, plug in with the data collection, the data management piece, and go through the process of correlating your data and getting your results and getting you know, an expert driven, plugged into the process, plugged into the successful legacy of continuous improvement, make it an integrated business. You know, that's where you're going to have success. So with all of this, so you can think big, start small, act fast. Um, that's how this works. And this success breeds success. Energy brings more, more energy around everybody. And, you know, pretty soon a predictive maintenance program is going to spawn a traceability program and on and on. And then you have no way of doing business. And that's what it's all about. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Mo. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you very much. I'd like to give a short summary and then uh, open the floor for questions. Um, in the meantime, if you have questions, uh, just please uh, drop them in the Q&A section. So key takeaways. Um, I think it's a good summary of uh, 
many of the important elements that Kelly presented. Number one, um, digital is about creating a foundation. So create a foundation, create a steering team, create knowledge hubs uh, that interlink the organization and the way of thinking. Uh, define strategies and goals is great. Launch them into action. Um, action needs people, process, technology, working together in harmony. Um, and then collect data. Collect data uh, for the right machines, uh, for the critical machines. Uh, have a data collection strategy. Uh, also have a data retention strategy, data visualization strategy. And then pick the right assets and implement the right assets. Um, the uh, approach that Kelly showed with the... Uh, the four quadrant chart and the criticality analysis um, is, is very meaningful uh, to find the right place to start to generate ROI for the business. Um, and, that, and last but not least, uh, you know, continue to work the process, work the process and use expert knowledge within, or within the organization to generate the business case, celebrate the success and uh, scale across the business. So thank you for those thoughts. And I think in closing, there was uh, two parts to this presentation. The first part was about the journey itself. Um, and we've, we've said this a few times already, but think big, start small, act now, act fast, scale fast, and make it operational with a proof of concept or a proof of value that aligns the business and the technology together and leverage techniques like artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive maintenance, to create smart connected manufacturing and then drive towards significant reductions in downtime and, and quality issues. On the other hand, keep in mind the challenges and learn from the challenges that you are facing or others have faced to improve your journey. And uh, some of those challenges include uh, the, the IT OT uh, convergence, uh, establishing uh, the right team on the steering committee side, uh, establishing the right data model, selecting the right assets, and at the end of the day, uh, true transformation with the biggest win and the biggest ROI. And like Kelly said, the lowest investment, highest ROI opportunity can actually be in manufacturing, on your factory floor, on the critical expensive assets uh, to maximize uptime quality and other critical KPIs for the business. So thank you so much. Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, Kelly and hand it back to Kevin Parker, please. Well, thanks so much, Mo. Um, and um, I just want our audience to know that they can still type their questions for Kelly and Mo in the Ask Your Question box on the screen. We'll get to as many questions as time allows. Questions that we don't get to will be posted online with the archived version of the webcast. Uh, also, remember to download a copy of the presentation and additional resources that may be available using the Event Resources tab. So let's get to our questions. Kelly, when I look at this first question, I think you really did a great job of answering, you know, why predictive maintenance or when would you want to start implementing a predictive maintenance program? But when I look at the market for predictive maintenance, it's a very interesting one because so many people are coming at it at the same time. The equipment providers have a stake in the game. Software providers are coming in. Technology providers see predictive maintenance as one of the prime applications for AI and uh, uh, other analytics. Uh, talk a little bit about that, whether you see it as a market that's about solutions or is it about assembling best of breed components? It's, it's very challenging right now. The, the solutions that are out there and the types of partners that are in, engaging in this space, it, it gets it gets it's gotten really big and overwhelming. And you know, when we go about something like this, we're really looking at partners to help us. You know, and, and our and, and in my mind, you find a partner that understands the full process. They understand data. They understand. You know, not just getting it, helping us to understand how to get it, to understand how to put it, how to manage it, help us think forward. Um, those skills are hard to come by, and finding a partner that can help you do that, and then they typically have experience with some software products that are successful, and, and if they're not implementing them and using them, if they're really good at that entire spectrum, they're, you know, they're, they're choosing something that's pretty good there. And there, to me, there's got to be a, a long line of success with something like that. And, and companies, you know, that 
our traditional building the plant floor that are buying or, or come to their own. Um, I mean, that approach is okay, but I'm really looking at somebody, a, a partner to help us on that selection that understands the entire process. And um, and to me, that's that's uh, that's huge. It's, it's hard to find a good partner like that when you do find them, they can help you select that piece of software. Well, thanks, Kelly. Mo, well, I'd be interested in hearing your slant on how the marketplace for predictive maintenance is maturing or evolving where the viable vendors are coming from and, and what you think the, the a good model would be for uh, choosing a partner but doing some of it yourself. Which 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 way would you go there? Yeah, and I think the answer to your question goes back to the maybe the second slide we showed in the beginning of the deck, the automation pyramid. So there is actually players from each layer of the pyramid entering the predictive market at uh, different levels of success. You have the machine vendors, as you had mentioned, uh, creating predictive solutions, but they're more usually tied to their own machines and they're not holistic. You have uh, data acquisition software providers that are starting to implement predictive modules as part of their offering. Um, then you have uh, a manufacturing execution system, IoT platforms that have either developed their own or made acquisitions. So in fact, at each level of that ISA 95 automation pyramid, there exists different strategies uh, for predictive analytics. When it comes to success in general and selecting the right partner, um, we always like to say you know, four things. Number one, the technology stack itself, you know, the features, the capabilities, the rollout, the interoperability with your IT infrastructure and so on. But more importantly, also the, the domain knowledge piece. Um, as Kelly mentioned, uh, being focused on one process is good, but how can you implement a holistic predictive maintenance strategy that includes an operation that has casting and machining and welding that requires domain knowledge in the field? Um, and lastly, I would say um, um, the scalability, so implementation, but scaling fast is, is an important concept. Uh, there are elements to creating templates and scaling those templates. And then last but not least, how do you create a quick implementation with a quick ROI and business case, um, which, which can be achieved in maybe 60 to 90 days from, from go live? So that's, that's what we see today, Kevin. Good. Thanks so much, Mo. Kelly, answer this for me, if you would. Do you think going forward, you're going to have to have artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities within your staff in-house? I, I believe we are going to, and you know what we probably won't do is is fully staff to, to cover all of our needs. But we're gonna we'll staff some very high level architect level folks in those spaces. That's kind of our strategy, and we'll partner for the the repetitive application of those technologies inside the business. I, I don't think you can totally rely on external partner. I mean, the, the architectural capabilities you would get around having that expertise, working with your technology team, your operations team, and getting that integrated experience at a high level, setting strategy, and leveraging external partners to bring you kind of the repetitive nature of applying an artificial intelligence or predictive technology. So from my standpoint, that's how I like to approach it. Good. Uh, Kelly, again to you, what has proved in the various projects of this type that you've participated in, what has proved to be the greatest challenge? I think it's always about people and it's you're getting engagement, um, getting them educated, getting them, getting them engaged, getting them to, to believe in the process and to go through the process, getting their time. Um, and that's a really huge deal. Sometimes you can have those first few things, but they're too busy really to give you the time. You know, so as you're diving in, let's just use a proof of concept example, you do everything right. I mean, you've got your management structure, you've got a goal, you got an asset that's perfect for it, and you got a, a team from the knowledge hub in there helping, but the local people are behind schedule, they can't keep up with their day job, they can't get engaged. And if that circumstance occurs, you're gonna have some problems getting success. And Knowing that when you come into those situations, you have to ensure the team is properly staffed with local resources. So maybe you have to backfill 
you know, getting engaged with the human resources department to do things like that up front will ensure success. So for me, it's all about the people. And every step of this starts to fail when people aren't engaged, can't give time, don't believe in it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, thanks, Kelly. Mo, now one of our listeners is asking for advice about uh, what he thinks is a, a big challenge in these projects, and that's how to cure or normalize existing data that might be incomplete, low quality in order to use it with uh, AI and other type tools? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. And um, Kelly showed the uh, analytics workflow from data to signals to features and then the assessment side and the prediction side. But uh, a big challenge is that data collection and signal processing piece initially, uh, because there is missing data or the integrity of the quality of the data is not good. So having a, a, a foundational data collection strategy that makes sense and what sensors are needed, what PLC controller data is needed uh, is very important. Um, and at the same time, I would say just an advice, uh, triggering the data acquisition in the right way. So with predictive maintenance, you don't need to stream and collect data every second and every minute just waiting for something to fail. There are creative ways to trigger data collection uh, during specific times that the machines are running. Um, and, and that way of data triggering can also reduce issues with uh, data quality or data integrity. So I, my advice, humble advice would be, look into your data collection strategy, set it up in the right way, understand the data sources, understand the triggers, understand where the data is going. And if that foundation is set up in the right way, um, you will have a very successful uh, analytic solution. Good. Kelly, I'd be interested in um, your comments about data collection. We have a question here from a listener asking about what types of data and what types of sensors um, and what kind of limitations are that should be considered in that case. Uh, and I, I just think it's fascinating that vibration has turned out to be such an important parameter. Sure. Um... You know, like I said in the presentation, you know, you need to consider anything and everything that could possibly help a predictive environment function effectively. And when, when you're doing your analysis and you find an asset that you want to do predictive on, you know, you're, you're going to know up front based on the data things you need to sensor to gather information from. And and it may be you know, a vibration sensor, temperature sensor, pressure sensor, whatever it may be. You're going to add those in where you know you need data from. That's easy. Um, ideally, that machine has got some intelligence behind it, and you're collecting process uh, variables every cycle of the machine. There's pressures and temperatures happening all around that piece of equipment that you can gather, and you should grab all of that. You just never know how you correlate data to drive results. And I'll, I'll, answer, I'll give you another an example which may answer another question here. You know, we did a project once in a casting environment, and there were 30 process variables collected every time the machine made a casting. We didn't add any sensors. There were sensors everywhere on this thing. And as we gathered the data, you know, we found, you know, through predictive technologies, there were four, a combination of four different process variables that together hit some certain threshold together when they changed in a certain point that 100% predicted a quality issue. So this is not predictive maintenance, but it just shows you we grabbed everything that we could and let the AI engine do its work. So the answer is grab everything you can, censor what you know you need to censor. Um, if you have physical limitations, you need to talk to a good integrator that can help you override that because we, we've been able to find technology to collect data from everything. And believe me, our company has really, really old stuff. So get all of it that you can and have a good provider to help you. Great. Mo, I'm going to give you the last question, even though we got only a little bit more than a minute to go here. Talk a little bit about the role of MES and ERP in predictive analytics. We've been talking about all these space age systems, but MES and ERP has in, been in our world for a while. Does it have a role for predictive maintenance as well? I'd actually love Kelly to add to this. He's more a CIO than I, but I just want to use the word interoperability. Um, I've seen many predictive solutions that complement and integrate with the maintenance systems, the CMMS and the ERP, 
So my view of interoperability is important when you select the right solution for your business. Uh, what's your take, Kelly? I think especially with MES, you know, ingesting, ingest, inserting information from a predictive tool into what you're already getting from MES can, can be very powerful. I mean, if you're doing data collection, scanning, traceability, ordering, you have all that information, you can tie that in with, with some predictive data. Data come from the PDX, from your predictive tools. Um, there's a lot of power to that, you know, but, but you need, if you want to do that, you have to really think about that engineer it up front. I think to be successful in predictive, you don't need ERP, you don't need MES, but I think the predictive can help with what you have in MES to help drive other improvements otherwhere. ERP, probably not so much. Great. Um, I want to thank everyone for the great questions and, and thanks especially to Kelly and Mo for sharing their time and expertise. I'd also like to expense, extend special thanks to our sponsor, IMI Sensors of the PCB Division for sponsoring today's event. Now that we're just about done, we'd like to hear how we did. The exit survey yeah, will pop up on the screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of Plant Engineering, I'd like to thank you for attending. This concludes our webcast. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.